So thank you. Thank you for invitation. Thank you for invitation for the seminar. And uh, yeah, I work. I work as an assistant professor at the National Taiwan University in Taipei, Taiwan. And uh, yeah, I spent actually more than 10 years uh, working in Masaryk University. So it's like my previous home. I'm really happy to see you guys again all around. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, currently the situation is, as you know, Taiwan, Taiwan has no problem with uh, COVID virus, but uh, the problem is that uh, it's completely sealed from the surroundings. So actually I am officially not allowed to travel. If I want to travel as a faculty member, I can't travel abroad, which is kind of tricky. But I hope in the summer I can go. So I hope in summer I will see you see you live back back in Brno. And so I, I think without further ado, let me let me start to present my presentation. And Zdenko, can you just tell me? Can yeah. you see it? Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. visible. It's okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So my uh, my talk will be will be about vegetation of cloud forest in Taiwan. Uh, cloud forest uh, is a vegetation type which I love for many many years, and uh, I would like to present few things. Uh, first, what we know about cloud forest, and also a few things we have been doing uh, about cloud forest. But uh, before I start, I want to. Remember Woody, mm, I would like to dedicate this talk to him because actually some 15 years ago uh, when we first time met, uh, he was important part which would initiate my interest in and passion, passion in the cloud forest. And actually I would say most of the work I will be presenting here we did together. So actually if he's around, he should be a quarter, uh, but unfortunately some year and a half he left us and so I hope uh, he found a peace and he's happily hiking somewhere in his loved Taiwanese mountains. And thank you very much. So let me briefly talk about what is actually cloud forest and how does it happen that cloud forest appears in uh, uh, the mountains. Uh, key reason for which initiates growth of the cloud forest is uh, the occurrence of cloud. In Taiwan, this cloud, this orographic clouds uh, comes from the eastern sides. They are mostly brought by the trade winds. And in Taiwan, the trade winds are of from the northeast direction. And they are steadily bringing the clouds which uh, after they touch the surface of the landmass uh, are uplifted to the elevation between 1500 and 2500 meters and uh, the forest in that elevation immerse in the cloud. Uh, if we, I talk about these trade winds just to remind you these basic things how the trade winds circulation in earth works. So actually Taiwan, Taiwan is uh, here and I think I should use this one. Taiwan is here and you can see this uh, northeast trade wind which is blowing here. But uh, in Taiwan another important wind system which is uh, which is blowing is a monsoon system. Taiwan is an island, currently island in the past it has been connected to the mainland because the shelf between Taiwan and continental China is quite shallow. So currently it's an island and is uh, influenced by winter and summer monsoons. The winter monsoons blowing from the continental China and uh, bringing the moisture during the winter months, especially to the northeastern part of Taiwan and also summer monsoon which is uh, blowing from southwest and uh, brings moisture during the summer months and actually these monsoons then they uh, kind of strengthen the cloud effect in the mountains and I should also not forget typhoons. Typhoons are not really related to the cloud but as are important uh, disturbance in Taiwan and uh, quite a lot of cloud forest in those elevations between 1500 and 2500 meters 
are often heavily damaged by typhoon disturbances. Here you can see actually the aggregated tracks of typhoons during last uh, 60 years. And uh, yes, yeah, so this is cloud. Uh, I was first time in Taiwan in 2005. I was sent there by Milan to join the vegetation vegetation survey and mapping project. And that time I was going with Woody hiking uh, in the center mountain range and I make this picture. Uh, it's a sea of clouds uh, coming in the afternoon from the eastern coast and basically flooding those valleys and slowly ascending to higher elevation. This is this picture is made from high elevation, so we are above the cloud. And this is how it looks like inside the cloud for us. And I would say this this picture quite nicely. Uh, this picture quite nicely illustrates the feeling when you are standing in the cloud forest and you are doing the survey and it's wet and cold and cloudy and uh, dark and you have depression because the, you didn't see sun for a couple of days. Uh, this picture is taken during the survey in 2013 in Yonan Lake and Lubos will remember this place because we surveyed this place together and we have been there seven days in the middle we go for stake to the city because we need to get rid of depression. So uh, let me briefly summarize what makes mountain cloud forest special and I will talk about mountain cloud forest in Taiwan. So there are several important environmental factors uh, which we should consider. First, cloud brings extra precipitation, extra rain. It's called horizontal precipitation and uh, it's a precipitation which is happening due to the cloud stripping. The cloud which pass through the canopy will actually condensate on the leaves and trunks and eventually drip to the floor. And in Taiwan, this horizontal precipitation adds some 9% to total annual precipitation, mean annual precipitation, which sounds quite less. Problem is like Taiwan has huge high uh, mean annual precipitation. In some places, this is uh, eastern coast, the precipitation is over 3000 millimeters per year and in some years it's even more. For comparison, uh, Brno I think has around 500 millimeters of mean annual precipitation, so it's really wet. So the cloud doesn't really bring so much extra water. High air humidity, during cloud events the relative humidity is often 100%. Uh, less light, 10 to 50 percent less according to the measurements, so it's quite dark. Uh, temperature will drop three to six degrees lower than would be at the same time during the non cloudy event. And then the chronic nutrient limitation, because uh, due to all this combination of these things like uh, low temperature, dark, wet, uh, the decomposition in the cloud forest is quite slow actually, so the cycling of nutrients is quite limited and cloud forests are kind of hungry and mostly limited perhaps by both phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, partly it's also caused by the fact that cloud forests in Taiwan are dominated by large uh, conifer species, I will talk about them, which make the decomposition even slower because the litter from needle leaf so woody species decompose even slower than broadleaf. Some pictures. Uh, this picture I made this January when we go again to Yonan Lake, which is one of the most cloudy places in Taiwan. And uh, this is kind of uh, really dense rhododendron formosana forest. Uh, it's not typical cloud forest actually, this is really dense one. This is more like a successional stage after disturbance because usually you don't get really so dense rhododendron stands because there are some larger trees, especially those uh, cypress trees. Uh, this is another look into the interior. You can see that trunks are covered by uh, mosses, epiphytes. Uh, the epiphytes are often ferns and uh, Typical fern for cloud forest are ferns from uh, the family Hymenophilaceae, uh, like this one, this filmy fern, this is Mecodium, and they really have only a single layer of the cells. 
And uh, if it gets dry, which is not too common in this cloud forest, so actually these ferns will completely fold and desiccate, but then when it gets wet, they quickly unfold and uh, keep living. Yeah, and some important plants, which uh, are kind of monumental in this forest, are Camaeciparis species. Uh, this is Camaeciparis formosensis from Smangus, uh, which is center part of Taiwan. It's a huge, large tree which can uh, live longer than 1,000 years. And uh, in Chinese, this is called Hongkwai, red cypress. And uh, there are two Camaeciparis species. Both are endemic to Taiwan. This Camaeciparis formosensis is likely living on the steeper slopes and regenerates on the landslides. And then the second one, uh, Camaeciparis obtusa variety formosana, is more living on the ridges and its seedlings regenerates on the fallen logs of the Camaeciparis trees. This is another picture, typical suit of uh, epiphytes. Here, several epiphytic ferns. This is also smangus, and uh, it's on the trunk of Camaeciparis. And this is a this is a dead tree. Woody is standing there as a measure. It's also from smangus from 2013. Uh, this is a dead Camaeciparis tree. And uh, I talk about the regeneration of uh, this Camaeciparis obtusa. These two Camaeciparis species really have very, very different regeneration strategies. So this Camaeciparis obtusa and the seedlings here, you can see actually are really almost exclusively growing on the fallen logs. And those fallen logs are usually fallen logs of dead Camaeciparis. And uh, we are kind of wondering whether this is really a place where eventually these seedlings will become adult trees and grow, or whether it's simply just a place where we can see more seedlings. So currently, uh, we show one more students plan to kind of answer the question whether this Camaeciparis obtusa variety for Mozana regenerates really mostly on these uh, fallen logs, make systematic survey and also survival analysis. And the other Camaeciparis regenerates on the landslides. Very, very different uh, strategy. So when we talk about cloud forest, Taiwanese cloud forest is kind of neglected because uh, I was searching uh, for literature overviews of the cloud forests. And as you can imagine, most of the cloud forest, I mean, mountain cloud forests are actually documented from tropical regions. So these are two different. Uh, these are two different reviews. One is the uh, Stadtmüller's uh, review from 1987, and the second one is Cloud Forest Agenda from 2004. And in both, actually, these reviews, the subtropical cloud forest in Taiwan is missing. I guess partly it could be caused by the fact that uh, a lot of literature, vegetation literature in Taiwan, has been uh, written in Japanese by. Japanese botanists during the occupation of Taiwan by Japan. And maybe it's maybe partly the reason why it haven't been known to the Western Western scientists. But for sure, Taiwan has cloud forest. And uh, <clears throat> you can see it actually here on this on this map from uh, the paper of Martin Schulz uh, and colleagues. Woody has been co-author on this paper which shows the distribution of cloud forest in Taiwan. The time they used uh, the uh, satellite uh, cloud data and try to identify the cloud frequency in different parts of Taiwan. So on this left figure, you can see the <clears throat> more blue color means high uh, fog frequency. This is a fog which touches the ground. Uh, this is a cloud which touches the uh, ground, which means it's become fog. That's really make potential for <clears throat> uh, make the cloud forest occurrence. And on the right side is predicted area. This green area is a predicted area of cloud forest occurrence in Taiwan. When you go to the detail, I will zoom to the northern part of Taiwan. Now I'm sitting in this basin. This is Taipei. And in the north of Taipei, there is uh, Yamingshan. This is Volcano. And south of Taipei starts this cloud forest region. 
you can actually see that uh, the cold forest is mostly on the ridges and then con continuous belt uh, along elevation formed by this cloud forest. And sometimes it's quite isolated and makes these kind of small islands. I will talk about this effect a little bit later. So <clears throat> if I want to talk about cloud forests, I should first briefly introduce uh, some vegetation classification. Uh, this is a result of Woody's uh, PhD, which he was doing when he studied in Brno under Milan's Hitri supervision. And the time he distinguished main vegetation types in uh, forest vegetation of Taiwan and for cloud forest, there are four main uh, vegetation units. This is kind of on the level of alliance. So there is a Kamaitsiparis mountain mixed cloud forest, which is the really true core cloud forest in higher elevation. Then there is a Quercus mountain evergreen broadleaf cloud forest, also sometimes called as a lower Quercus forest. And then there is a Fagus mountain deciduous broadleaf cloud forest. These three units belong to subtropical mountain cloud forest. And then in the southern tip of Taiwan, there is a tropical mountain cloud forest. In this map uh, on this level left panel, you can actually see this Passania Elo Carpus mountain evergreen broadleaf cloud forest occurs really just in the southern tip of Taiwan, where occurs already, already the tropical element flora. Uh, this right panel is kind of interesting. I like to visualize it in this way. That's the way how Taiwan is actually like to visualize the uh, vegetation zonation. You can see these four different colors that represents these four different units. So the dark blue is upper cloud forest, the light green is lower cloud forest, and these red dots is a uh, beach forest, fagus forest, very, very special vegetation. And only in the southern tip there is the tropical forest. Well, and because in Brno, we like to classify things in even more details than I put here. Also, a result of another Woody's paper from 2015 published in Ecological Research, uh, where uh, he classified, uh, he and colleagues classified the uh, vegetation of upper and lower cloud forest into individual associations and also provide a cocktail determination key which allows. Uh, automatic assignment of uh, relevance into these vegetation types. You can see that there is also Alliance 3, which is Fagion Hayate. This was described by Hukushima, Japanese researcher, and it's related to Taiwan, uh, Japanese vegetation. There is only single association. Uh, we always talk about that there should be at least three different associations in Taiwan. And Alliance 4 is not yet described. It's uh, this Passanio Elocarpus tropical cloud forest. So if you want to identify cloud forest vegetation into associations. You're welcome. You can use this determination key. Let me stop briefly uh, by talking about beach forest because uh, for me as a European to see the beach in Taiwanese mountains is really quite uh, amazing. Taiwan has Fagus Hayate. This uh, species is actually not endemic to Taiwan or depends how you take it. Fagus Hayate uh, or this, another variety also occurs in continental China, but otherwise the main distribution is in Taiwan. And uh, on the left side, you can see actually quite typical shape of the Fagus, Fagus, uh, Fagus crown. And here on the right side, you can see the leaves of Fagus Hayate, Taiwan Shweichingang. And uh, the distribution is quite special. This is a uh, copy of the distribution map from Taiwan. And this is a northern part of Taiwan. This is a Ilan basin. And actually the, uh, the Fagus forest occurs in this kind of ring of the mountains in the elevation, which is between like 1000 to 2000 meters. And only one occurrence is more in the eastern part, western part of Taiwan, which is kind of isolated. Uh, why this special distribution? I draw this map using Google Earth. Uh, this is a view from northeast to the northern part of Taiwan. 
And you can see the mountains, you can see the Elan, the delta of uh, Elan basin. And these white arrows are vegetation plots which contains Fagus hayate, and they are really in this kind of ring uh, around this around this uh, delta. And all these plots are under the direct influence of northeastern monsoon, so they are in higher elevation. It's in the cloud zone, and at the same time, they often occur on relatively sharp mountains. They doesn't really grow on the wide mountain ranges, but uh, usually occur on the sharp mountains, which are directly exposed to the wind, northeastern monsoon. Uh, this one plot is a special occurrence. It's in Shinju. It's in drier part. But when we hike there, uh, go to this peak, then actually when we get to that mountain, then we can see that there is a, a valley through which actually this mountain is exposed to the northeastern monsoon. So northeastern monsoon for sure is an important factor which maintains occurrence of this Fagus forest. Uh, we have a study region in Lalashan, and I will talk about it several times. Lalashan Mountains is this peak. Uh, it's uh, south of Taipei, and on this uh, aerial photograph from Google Earth, you can actually see uh, the distribution of the Fagus Forest on the ridge. It's quite narrow stripe, and all this uh, like brown to orange color indicates the Fagus Forest distribution. What is interesting is that actually just beside there is another mountain which is almost the same elevation. It's Taman Shan, but it doesn't have cloud forest. Uh, it doesn't have Fagus forest. And I always wonder like what, why, why just close to each other there are two mountains, one has and one doesn't have uh, Fagus forest. Uh, of course, it can be coincidence. One reason might be that Taman Shan is relatively flat, while Lala Shan is quite sharp. And one thing we just hike to Fagus Forest uh, two, two weeks ago. One thing which, which is really lovely is when you see the in the spring the fresh green color of the freshly flushing leaves, because otherwise the cloud forest has this kind of dark green color of those evergreen species, which keep the leaves for several years, and also those evergreen conifers. So actually to see this Light green color is really nice. It uh, just brings the feeling of the spring. And what is interesting also on this Fagus forest is that almost all locations are undergrown by bamboo, Yushania Nitakaya menzis. Uh, it's an endemic Taiwanese bamboo which grows from middle to high elevation. And uh, what you can see actually on this picture, so also made two weeks ago, is there is a curious situation that the bamboo started to flower last year and when bamboo flowers it means it will die and actually what is interesting it flowers in large regions so actually all this beech forest all that ring of the beech forest the bamboo there is flowering and this year you can see it's already dead before it was a dense tussock of bamboo but it's dead and at the same time the beech is flowering and uh, it was flowering already last year, and this year we can see actually the seedlings of Fagus Hayate there. So there is a regeneration, which is quite a unique opportunity, because when you go to this Fagus forest and you search for young trees or seedlings, you won't find anything. That's a weird thing about this Fagus vegetation. At least those sites I visited, I never see young trees or seedlings. I always see only old trees which indicates that these forests have some troubles with regeneration. But maybe actually this is a window of opportunity. There is a masting year last year and this year looks like also. And Dushani, I just die. So. Yeah, let me uh, mention one more thing. Uh, I, I want to talk about few studies we try to do in cloud forests in Taiwan. And uh, my strategy will be that I will start from relatively large scale ideas and eventually zoom into relatively fine scale studies. And uh, one uh, interesting pattern which occur uh, in the study of Professor Su in 1984, uh, Su Hornje, who sadly passed away uh, in the end of last year, uh, he actually found that uh, the distribution of the vegetation along 
uh, latitude in Taiwan has this kind of hump shape pattern. So this is a map of Taiwan with main uh, ridges, mountain ridges, and this is a profile of Taiwan. And these are his uh, uh, estimated vegetation zones in different transects along elevation. So you go from north to south and you can see different colors are different vegetation types. And this white part and this black part, that's a cloud forest. The white one is lower cloud forest and the black one is more, oh, sorry, the white one is either lower or upper cloud forest and the black one is Kamatsiparis vegetation. And it caused this kind of hump shape pattern. He actually proposed idea that this is because of Masson Erhebung effect. Uh, Masson Erhebung effect is, uh, I will talk about it a little bit later. I, uh, we got the idea that we can use vegetation database of Taiwan, which includes vegetation plots sampled uh, during vegetation mapping project between 2003 to 2007. That's around 3,500 plots. And also vegetation plots which have been uh, excerpt from published studies uh, as far as from 1978. This vegetation database was built during the vegetation mapping project under the supervision of Professor She and uh, Professor Cho. And what we did, we take these vegetation plots, uh, we take only nature forest, avoid plantations, and uh, take only zonal vegetation types. So we ignore a zonal vegetation types growing on the landslides or successional stages. And we just draw the same map as Professor Su, but we base it on uh, the real data. So dif different colors are different vegetation types. Here, uh, the dark green and light green indicates the cloud forest. And I also add here, uh, the distribution along latitude for the lower uh, boundary of this vegetation zone. So, for example, this green line is actually boundary between lower cloud zone and this uh, submountain evergreen forest, Macus Castanopsis zone. And you can see actually there is a hump shape pattern. In when you are in the center part of Taiwan to see cloud forests, you have to climb higher. The explanation for this proposed by Professor Su is Massenerhebung effect, uh, or in English it's uh, called mass elevation effect. Uh, if you have large, uh, more massive mountains, the vegetation zones are shifted upslope. Uh, it has been first time documented at the beginning of 20th century by German researchers from Alps. And they also show that actually in the marginal mountain ranges, which are not in the center part, on the other side of vegetation is more like suppressed vegetation zonation is suppressed to lower elevations. There are usually mentioned three main effects which composed Massener Hebung. Uh, one is land mass heating effect. Land mass heating effect means that because of the way how the radiation is reflected by large uh, massive mountains, then actually if you are in the more massive mountains, you got a uh, higher temperature and that's why the zonation of vegetation is shifted up, up, upward. Uh, on the other side, there is a cooling effect of wind in the marginal mountains. So actually the wind, which does not really get inside the mountain range, but influence the marginal mountain peaks, which are more isolated, is on the other side cooling. So vegetation is suppressed to lower elevation. And in Taiwan comes also the cooling effect of cloud, not only in Taiwan, but also in the tropical regions. This has been first described by Grab. And that cloud actually has also cooling effect and cause the uh, downslope ship of vegetation zones. So yeah, I think actually, we have quite good evidence that the Massenerhebung effect is in action, is happening in Taiwan because in center part of Taiwan, the vegetation is shifted upslope and for cloud forest, it works very well actually. And in the marginal parts in north and south, the vegetation is shifted downslope. Uh, in Yamingshan, in the volcano north of Taipei, you can see actually cloud forest species as low as at 1000 meters elevation. Okay, so when I talk about this large scale pattern, let me let me mention a few, uh, few interesting things. Uh, one thing is 
when we think about the vegetation diversity pattern, pattern of woody species richness along elevation, then uh, we found that actually there is a hump shape pattern. This is something which Woody did already some 10 years ago when he was in Brno and uh, he was presenting actually results on EVS conference in Rome. And uh, when uh, we start to do research in Taiwan recently, we decided uh, we have a student, uh, Poyo Lin, who decided that actually he will do it in, for master thesis. He will make the analysis in more uh, detail and precise way. He will also standardize the data and make sure that actually this pattern holds also in different parts of Taiwan if you slice Taiwan into the slices. Uh, so what you can see here, if you focus on this right panel, uh, on the x-axis is elevation and on the y-axis is species richness. We slice, we slice Taiwan into the uh, slices, elevation zones, elevation bands around 230 meters and calculated the species pool, number of species in each of these elevation zones from lowlands to high elevation. And what is interesting, you can see this kind of hump shape actually. The highest elevation is not in the lowland. The highest elevation is in the middle, in the lower middle elevation. It's around 1,100 meters. And uh, then it starts to decline down. There are several different interpretations why this is happening. And this was actually part of Poyo's master thesis he defended just recently. Uh, of course, it could be influenced because of the uh, middleman effect, which is a uh, null expectation of diversity along constrained uh, bounded domain. It's also because of the interaction between productivity and uh, area, land area and heterogeneity. But there is also one interesting option. And this interesting option is that actually that peak of diversity occurs just right below the cloud zone. Uh, this is what you see actually in this diagram. Here I put again this diversity pattern and here this left panel shows overlap of species along elevation. If there is a peak, then it means that in this elevation occur species from high and low elevation together. So that's kind of like ecotone zone. In this zone you actually can see the species uh, from mingling species from low and high elevation. From high elevation, I mean mostly the cloud forest species. So this is actually one of these peaks and this peak, ecotone zone, more or less like overlap with the diversity peak of woody species along elevation. Uh, in this diagram here are elevation distributions of individual vegetation types. So this green one, one, two, three and four, these are cloud forests. And this red one are submountain evergreen broadleaf forests. And this dashed line is actually this ecotone part. So one reason might be actually that this peak of diversity might be also caused because of overlap of mountain and lowland species and that elevation. And another interesting thing, because when you see distribution of cloud forests in Taiwan, then you can't help thinking whether actually the cloud forest doesn't act as the island system, a little bit like an island, terrestrial island system. And uh, my student, my master student, Yu Pei Tseng, she tried to do a very quite simple analysis actually, try to understand whether it's possible that if you have larger cloud forest patch, then it will have more cloud forest specialists. That's somehow what you would expect if uh, some terrestrial biome or biotope habitat acts as an island system. Then if you have larger island, then it will have not only more species in that island, that makes sense, but in the fixed sampled area, in this case 20 by 20 meters, you would get more species specialized to this habitat. So what we did is we take vegetation database again, we choose only vegetation plots from those two cloud zones, those uh, upper and lower cloud vegetation. And uh, what you pay did is that around each this vegetation plot, which is 20 by 20 meters, she draw the buffer with radius of three kilometers. And she somehow, because we know what's the area of the cloud forest predicted by Schultz, map of the Schultz at Ali, 
So we somehow know in some of these surroundings, for example here, if you see this vegetation plot, then actually the cloud forest is quite isolated and most of the surrounding is actually different vegetation type, while some other vegetation plots are surrounded mostly by cloud forest. And the question is, if we uh, display number of specialist species along the gradient between, this is displayed here, uh, proportion of the cloud forest area within this three kilometers buffer. So you can see on the left is the situation that you have very low uh, area of the cloud forest in this buffer. And when you go to the right here, this is one, which means most of the buffer is actually formed by the cloud forest vegetation. And there is a weak yet significant signal that actually along this gradient number of species in the plot increases. Here we consider only specialist species. If we use all species, then actually the pattern is exactly opposite. Uh, those plots which are surrounded by different forests, they have actually higher diversity. But when we consider only cloud specialists, there is a positive pattern. Uh, in this case, as a cloud specialist, we count species which are diagnostic for cloud forest vegetation. And in these uh, diagrams below, uh, as a cloud specialist, we consider species which have ecological optima in the cloud zone. I will talk about this a little bit later, but uh, we try to quantify something like Ellenberg type indicator values for cloud using herbarium spacement database. And those species which have very high Ellenberg value for cloud, we consider as a cloud specialist. And uh, for example, if you take only 5% of all the species with these Ellenberg indicator values, those which have the highest for cloud, then you can actually see that there is a positive relationship between area of the cloud surrounding the plot, cloud forest surrounding the plot, and number of specialist species. So, I'm not sure whether it's actually convincing, but I have a feeling that cloud forest might really work as a terrestrial island system. And if it's true, and if it's not just some artifact in our analysis, then this might be actually a good, interesting topic for the future to study. So that was the kind of like large scale things. And uh, now let's zoom a little bit into more small scale pattern of vegetation. Uh, when I started to work in Taiwan and I applied for my first ground project, that time we decided to compare uh, sub-mountain evergreen broadleaf forest with those two cloud forest zones. So what we did actually is uh, the time with, with, with Woody, we selected six elevation places, six localities along elevation. It's south of Taipei Basin. This is a Taipei Basin. This is a place I'm just now sitting. And in these mountains, uh, from elevation to from 850 to 2150 meters above sea level, we set up localities uh, and survey. So uh, if you think about the whole Taiwan, this is whole Taiwan. This is north. This is south. Uh, this is elevation. These are mountains. Then our Lalashan transect, we call it Lalashan transect because the top is close to Lalashan mountain, uh, is roughly in uh, this position from 850 meters to 2100 meters elevation. And it crosses this free vegetation zone from uh, sub mountain evergreen to mountain evergreen to mountain mixed cloud forest. And these are elevation zones. This is a, a climate diagram which display uh, climate in roughly middle of this transect. This is a weather station operated by forest uh, by weather, weather bureau, Taiwanese weather bureau. It's called Alashan elevation 3000 meters. And uh, you can actually see that it's a really wet area. Uh, you have some mild frost in January. Uh, you have relatively mild temperatures up to 20 degrees of Celsius. And in this range, you have around 2000 millimeters of precipitation. 
Highest temperature, uh, monthly temperature is 24 degrees, lowest is around six, but actually in winter it can be below zero or close to zero. And in each elevation band, we actually survey 10 vegetation plots, 10 by 10 meters. We survey forest vegetation, uh, woody species, and we also survey all herb species, lianas, epiphytes. Uh, we take soil, measure soil properties, and we measure traits. Uh, this is actually our first proper experience with uh, measuring the traits of both woody and fern species in Taiwan. Uh, these are just pictures illustrating uh, different vegetation zones. This is a upper cloud zone. Uh, this is also cloud zone, but here there are missing conifer species, so it's more green. And this is relatively low elevation, so these are somehow like contrasting pictures from these vegetation types. Uh, what I want to say, uh, one important thing we try to understand is which environmental factors make cloud forest vegetation special. What actually from that uh, set of environmental factors like low light, high relative air humidity, higher precipitation, uh, nutrient limitation, what might be the key reason which makes the cloud forest appear as it looks like? So it's quite often shorter. Uh, the leaves are evergreen broadleaf. They are quite thick. They have quite uh, low specific leaf area. They have quite high uh, leaf diameter content. And uh, we try to understand like actually which of the factors might be the key to influence vegetation of the cloud forest. Why we do traits? Uh, we assume that actually traits, especially if the traits are functional, they can somehow identify the key mechanism or the key environmental variable, which is responsible for selecting the species into the community. So along this elevation transect, we uh, collected leaf traits of woody species and leaf and woody traits. Uh, we also core the trees and measure wood density measure leaf area, specific leaf area, all those basic leaf traits you can imagine to measure, also wind density. This was work of uh, Yan Shen Shen, my master student who graduated two years ago. And one, one funny, like kind of funny, one special thing we also measure one trait is uh, this leaf water repellency. Kind of our idea when we started to do this thing was that maybe the trees in cloud forests will try to get rid of water on the, on the surface of the leaves because it's so humid. So we found that there is a, um, this uh, leaf water repellency method. When we take the leaf and we drop the droplet of some five microliters of distilled water on the surface of the leaf, and make a picture just by seeing simple camera, make a picture of this droplet from the side. And then we actually measure this angle. So you can see here are three different leaves with three different droplets. And uh, you can see actually that this uh, angle is quite sharp, while this angle is actually quite, quite high, quite blunt. Uh, which means actually this species is quite water repellent. It's a little bit like you have a Guratex, Guratex jacket and you drop the water and the water just uh, drip down. So that's also one trait we try to measure. And yeah, and we also measure traits for the ferns. That was experiment. There's very few studies in the world actually measures traits, leaf traits for ferns. It's uh, extremely time consuming. And you can see this is uh, Tsong Yi Lin, my master student. He also graduated it's already one and a half year ago. And here he is bowing in front of Tsiatea before he started to measure the leaf area because it really takes long time to do. But we have quite interesting data about leaf traits of also fern species, so not only woody species. Uh, I won't go too much to the details. We measure different traits, uh, also including the nitrogen stable isotopes, vein density, wood density, repellency, and so on. And uh, at the same time, we assume that in higher elevation will be more cloudy, but we want to have some data about microclimate. So what we did in three fixed plots in each elevation zone, we put this hobo 
a microclimatic station, uh, put it on the northern side of the tree of the middle size and leave it there for two years and basically let it recording and then just download the data. So we have quite detailed data about relative humidity and temperature across the period of two years uh, along this uh, transect. And uh, some of these data are here. It's just like when we think about elevation, uh, then these six diagrams display the pattern of microclimatic measurements along elevation. So all is either temperature or or a relative humidity. The upper row is about temperature. So it's a mean annual temperature measured during one year. In this case, the second year data are still not actually calculated, but you can see that this is quite trivial. When you go to higher elevation, you have a steady decline on mean annual temperature. Uh, this is mean annual minimum temperature and mean, mean annual maximum temperature. So here we actually calculated the minimum and maximum daily temperatures and calculated the annual annual means of that. And you can see again there are some there is a clear decline. What is actually interesting here is that this decline is a little bit milder in higher elevation. This is for minimum temperature. It's actually not getting so cold as it could according to this elevation in the cloud forest. Most likely because the cloud has the buffering effect on the temperature. It doesn't really get so cold if it's cloudy. And on the lower row it's about wetness and dry events. One big disappointment was actually that we can't really see that higher elevation is more wet. Uh, and this diagram is the proportion of days with wet events. Uh, as a wet event we define the day with mean relative humidity more than 98 percent. And you can see there is no really elevation pattern. What is a little bit more interesting is dry events. So this is a proportion of days during the year when the relative humidity drops below 75 percent. And you can actually see that in higher elevation it can get quite dry. The cloud forest, if it's foggy, cloud forest is wet like hell. But if it's dry, then actually cloud forest, if the fog didn't come, the cloud forest could be quite dry. And this is frosty events. This last panel is frosty events. Frost is defined as the temperature below two degrees of Celsius. Uh, because this climatic measurement was in one and a half meters above ground. And this is a number of days with these frosty events. So in higher elevation, especially in the sites exposed to the northeastern monsoon, you can get quite few frosty days during the year. And when we analyze the soil conditions, then there are several interesting patterns. Some of them are quite trivial. Uh, when we increase elevation, the soil pH goes down. Even the scatter is quite large, actually. Uh, just note that soil pH in Taiwan is extremely acid. All these soil pH values are between 3 to like 4.3, 4.5. So it's really acid soil. On the other side, when you get to high elevation, the CN ratio, the ratio between carbon and nitrogen, is getting wider and wider. Uh, when you get to the cloud zone, and at the situation when you get those large conifers with this hard to decompose litter, you get quite high CN ratio in the soil, which is directly below. What is a little bit uh, surprising is soil, soil phosphorus, which is actually increasing to higher elevation, even though I quite believe actually that there is a shortage in phosphorus availability in cloud forest. This can be soil phosphorus, which is actually binded in the organic matter. And also the pattern of soil calcium, which is slightly unimodal, highs in the middle elevation. Okay, uh, important part result of this study are actually traits, uh, response of the traits to environmental variables. Uh, trade environment analysis is kind of complicated and I don't want to really dip too much into the detail. What I did here is that I use RLQ analysis, which combines three different matrices, environmental variables, species composition data and trade data together to see how environment and traits are related to each other in one single analysis. What is interesting is that actually uh, in our data there are two main environmental variables. Elevation makes sense because the transect is done along elevation from low to high elevation. 
But perpendicular to that is a CN ratio. CN ratio, especially in higher elevation, can be quite high or quite low. And as you can see here, actually, CN ratio is positively correlated to number of conifers individuals in this case. So it's clear like CN ratio is related to conifer species. I want to mention here that actually all these traits which we measure on woody species are not measured for conifers. It's quite difficult to measure leaf traits for conifer species actually. So we just remove conifers, those Kamatsipari species out of analysis. And here you can see that with elevation negatively correlates leaf area. When you go to high elevation, the leaves are shrinking, getting smaller. This is effect of temperature because the leaves are basically protecting themselves against frosty bites or getting smaller. And when we think about CN ratio, I think CN ratio is quite strongly related to leaf economic spectrum traits, like specific leaf area, uh, leaf thickness. There is also LDMC, but actually in this case, LDMC is not obviously related to CN ratio. But I believe actually that this axis is mostly availability of nutrients. If there is a high CN ratio because of presence of large conifers, uh, it's a nutrient limited uh, habitat and the species are more conservative. They have more conservative strategy. They have uh, thick leaves with high content of chlorophyll and uh, high amount of dry mass and low specific leaf area. Uh, this is basically the same story expressed by relating community weighted mean of these traits to either elevation CN ratio or in this case uh, pH. Uh, I think pH is negatively related to CN ratio and uh, I think positively related to availability of nutrients in the cloud forest. Well, uh, one interesting thing, which I a little bit have troubles to believe whether it's really true, but uh, when we think about leaf water repellency, that quite work demanding method to measure trade, my expectation or our expectation was that in high elevation, the species will try to get rid of water. So they will have high level of water repellency. Uh, you can measure water repellency on the adaxial and abaxial upper and below side of the leaf. On the upper side, there is no relationship. But if you calculate community weighted mean from woody species of this leaf water repellency and project it along elevation, then actually there is negative pattern. Surprisingly, high elevation species tend to like being vetted by the water and lowland species try to get rid of the moisture. I'm not sure how much this is convincing actually, but uh, there is a similar study. The only study I found about this water repellency is from Mexico, where they argue that actually the leaves uh, in the cloud forest might prefer to be more vettable because they can in this way condense the water during the drought events and this will protect them against the drought. But I'm not sure whether this is possible also in Taiwanese forest. Uh, yeah, one of the things we did on this transect as an experiment, and we have quite good experience with that, is actually also litter decomposition experiment. All is about availability of nutrients and one way how you can try to understand whether nutrients are made available is that you can try to do litter decomposition to see how fast it will decompose. But at the same time, it's kind of complex method which needs quite uh, labors treatment because you need to go to the field many times. Some of the locations in this transect needs to have like two days hiking with heavy packs and sleeping there. So we use the method which has been introduced recently and it's uh, we buried actually Lipton tea bags which are uh, which are covered by plastic uh, which are wrapped in the plastic tea bag PET. Uh, you have two tea bags you have a green tea and rooibos the green tea is actually quite ugly but in Taiwan it's very difficult to buy it. Taiwan is they have their nice green tea and nobody wants to have this Lipton tea. But anyway, we order it from Dutch and uh, we order big boxes and bury it in many places along this elevation gradient, leave it there for three months, then collect and see how much material get actually decomposed and how much of this tea material uh, was left there. 
and uh, this was done by Poyo Lin, and uh, it actually brings quite interesting insight into how fast is the decomposition rate when we regress the composition rate calculated from this TBEC experiment against environmental variables. It turned out that it relates negatively to three of them, soil depth, elevation, and soil pH. Uh, for soil depth, it kind of makes sense because deeper soil indicates you have quite thick layer of not decomposed organic matter. And that's usually actually hard to decompose, so the decomposition rate is low. Along elevation, yes, in low elevation, the decomposition is higher than in high elevation because it's warmer. And there is also a relation to soil, soil pH, which is kind of not intuitive, but it's marginally significant. So actually this TBEC can help us to understand uh, the rate with which the nutrients are recycled, and we can use these as environmental variable. So when I conclude this, uh, then uh, actually uh, from this transect we found that elevation is negatively related to leaf area which is most likely because of the temperature and the traits related to plant economic spectrum like specific leaf area and leaf dry matter content are strongly related to soil properties like cn ratio and ph and that's most probably because of the nutrient availability and this has been also uh, confirmed by the decomposition experiment actually and somehow surprisingly cow for a species seems to be adapted to cope with drought stress so they have lower leaf water repellency in higher elevation trying to attract water not to suffer the drought what we want to do now is actually because this was elevation transect and kind of disadvantage of elevation transect is that along elevation you change many things you change not only presence of cloud but you change also temperature radiation uh, vapor pressure many things so what we want to do now and that's what we are doing this season actually and we are just in the stage of selecting localities we want to do uh, sampling at the same elevation from west to east and sample in regions with different fog frequency. So actually this region is uh, selected as potential localities for our sampling. The color indicates the fog frequency, the dark blue is the highest fog frequency and the red color is the lowest fog frequency. And now we will be sampling actually in this region in a relatively fixed elevation of roughly 2000 meters above sea level because this will help us to have really data along gradient of only fog, but not gradient of elevation, which goes also with changes in temperature. So that's our plan for this summer. And the last thing I want to mention, and I already blah blah for 60 minutes almost, uh, when we go to the fine scale, then uh, we decided two years ago to establish our forest dynamics plot in La La Shan. Uh, it's close to the saddle between Lalashan Mountain, which is here. This is Taipei. This is Lalashan Mountain with Fagus Forest. This is Tamanshan Mountain with Kamatsi Paris Optusa Forest. And this is actually somewhere in the middle. And we set up one hectare permanent plot. The three dimensional map is here. You can see it's kind of like two small peaks and it's a ridge between east and west. And this site is heavily exposed to the wind, which is actually in the end turned out to be quite important. Uh, together with students, we spent, we spent two seasons by surveying this forest. It's actually quite not easy because it's quite complicated structure of those cypress trees and uh, rhododendrons, which are a little bit like lianas, trochodendrons, and all the other evergreen broadleaf species, plus some deciduous. Uh, we also sample traits of woody species in the fine scale and we also sample the herb layer and uh, the results are just coming because three of my students are graduating this semester they all work actually in this forest dynamics plot so uh, this is a one hectare map with uh, individual individual positions of individual trees you can see that proportion the size of this circle here is proportional to their dbh and what is interesting here this uh, 
contours indicates elevation. So actually this is ridge, this is ridge, this is valley, and this is a west face, uh, east facing windward side, which is very densely populated by relatively thin branch, uh, relatively thin stems of the trees. And if we display separately evergreen broadleaf species, uh, conifer species. Here it's actually Camarciparis obtusa, Camarciparis formosana, uh, very few, and also Tsuga, Chinensis. And this is deciduous species. Then we see some pattern actually. Conifer species are mostly in these concave uh, convex sites on those ridges. Those large conifer species are mostly here, while deciduous species are more concentrated in these windward sites actually. And for broadleaf species, uh, high density of individuals is also on this windward side, which is actually quite interesting and illustrating how this pattern looks like. We have some environmental variables. I'm already a little bit late, so I won't go to the detail. Just uh, this is a gradient of windwardness. The wind is blowing from the east, so this is a wind exposed site. And also this is a pH. You can see that actually low pH, this red color, is usually in the regions which are either flat or convex. And there are some large conifer species. On the other side, the highest pH are either in the valley or on the windward side of this plot. So we did several things. We have map of all individual trees. Uh, Chenting, who was working on the woody species, draw the uh, vegetation classification. We have free vegetation type, windward, then this uh, main vegetation type dominated by Camarciparis, and then the valley type, this light blue, which is concentrated in the valleys uh, in this region. And again, we collected traits, that's work of uh, Inochli. And in this case, we actually focus also in intraspecific trait variation. Intraspecific trait variation, uh, we collected in uh, the grid of 25 systematically distributed subplots, 10 by 10 meters. We measure traits for uh, at least three individuals of each species in those plots. So actually, we have the same species measured across several times across the across the permanent plot. And this turned to be quite important actually because there is quite strong gradient along windwardness. So from the windward to leeward side in intraspecific trait variation of woody species. And this is for specific leaf area and for leaf thickness. So actually here intraspecific trait variation here is uh, displayed by this uh, gray uh, dashed line. This is communitivated mean of intraspecific trait variation. And that simply means that they are the same species in the windward and leeward sides, but in the windward side they have lower specific leaf area, while on the leeward side they have a higher specific leaf area. And for leaf thickness it's opposite. Windward sides have species, uh, the same species have more thicker leaves than on the leeward. I would say this is clearly actually adaptation to wind, to the mechanical uh, stress which is caused by the wind effect. And it's quite important actually to see this pattern, especially because we have it on the intraspecific trade level. And the last thing I want to mention uh, is kind of like my dream, uh, which came true. We have a weather station very close to Lalashan forest dynamics plot. Thanks to Quen Song, who managed all the paperwork, we hire, we rented this all abandoned weather station, which before has been operated by uh, Taiwan Forestry Bureau. It's just 100 meters from the uh, forest, from our permanent plot. And we put all different loggers there. But what is important, we have this visibility logger. And that's for the first time we are able to really measure the fog, because if the fog is coming, the visibility declines. And uh, having the data from a little bit over seven months, actually, at this moment, from May to now, we can actually see somehow the pattern of climate or weather, in this case, weather, because this is a one day. Uh, this is how it looks like one 
kind of typical summer day in that cloud forest in Lalashan. Up there is temperature, in the middle is relative humidity, and below is visibility, visibility in meters. And uh, this is a June 28, 2020. This is one of the days we have been surveying there. At six o'clock in the morning, sun rises and temperature goes up. And around lunchtime, actually, the fog is coming and the temperature will start to decline down. That the fog is coming, you can see on this visibility curve because at night and the whole morning until the lunchtime, visibility was very good, 4,000 meters. And then suddenly the fog came and visibility dropped below 1,000 meters and there have been several waves. And then after like six o'clock in the evening, the fog just disappeared, lifted and visibility was very good. You can also see that actually relative humidity in the morning become drier, lower, but when the fog when the lunchtime is coming and then the fog came, the relative humidity get back to 100%. So that's kind of typical day in the cloud forest. And this diagram shows the pattern of climate to, from May 2020 to January 2021. Again, temperature in the uppercase, mean daily temperature. You can see actually in January, we have some very cold event. It's very unusual actually. I guess that's because this year is set to be uh, La Nina, so it's kind of unusually cold winter. I go to have a look into that uh, Lalashan forest dynamics plot to see how this evergreen broadleaf forest looks like under snow and frost. And we actually see this snow in the forest in Taiwan in relatively low elevation. This is 1,700 meters. It was really very unusual actually for me the first time to see this situation, combination of evergreen broadleaf species and snow. And relative humidity, and this is fog events. You can see actually the fog is more frequent in winter, especially in November. And we have also precipitation, so we can measure not only only fog, which is related to visibility, but also amount of precipitation in different parts. So these are quite important data. We hope actually several things. We keep monitoring the climate there for a couple of years, I hope. And I also hope that we will be able to get the old data from the previous owner who ran this station for comparison for the future. Let me mention one more thing. And that's actually, I already started to talk about it before. One thing I hope to do, and I know that I can't do it actually, but I hope actually at least to talk about that is to introduce Allenberg type, indi Allenberg type indicator values for species of Taiwanese flora. This is something we talked about with Woody before. And uh, we think in Europe, I don't have to introduce it to Europeans, it's a really useful concept and we all use it since our undergraduate studies. But in Taiwan it's something completely unknown. Uh, and I was kind of curious to see where uh, where is it used, this Allenberg type system. In Europe it's common, we have also our modification by Milan Lubos, Fir, Irkasado, and Ali for Czech flora. Out of Europe, it's in North America, and it's usually brought to North America by Europeans, by the way, by Klinka and Kraina to British Columbia by Czech scientists, by Bakuzis, he was Estonian, to Minnesota, and Curtis, who introduced it in Wisconsin. And there is one case also from Ethiopia. But otherwise in Asia, it's unknown. So we did a small study. Uh, Andy uh, Chinlin Huang, my student, he used herbarium spacement data and fog frequency GIS layer to quantify species optima of woody species along fog frequency. So actually in this histogram, you can see uh, distribution uh, of uh, the woody species. These are values which we arbitrarily assign to fog frequency. High values of fog frequency means the fog is very common. They got value nine, Allenberg type indicator value for fog. And these are in the region when fog is completely missing. And you can see there are not too many actually cloud specialists or cloud affected species. And that it works, it seems like it's working. We use the data from vegetation database and we identify individual vegetation types and calculated mean Allenberg indicator values for fog 
for these vegetation types. And those types which have higher values, those gray one here, are actually those which are cloud forests. It's a little bit disappointing here. This is actually high elevation forest, which contains also quite fog affected species. But otherwise it works actually quite well. For tropical forest, this cloud forest, tropical cloud forest has also higher mean Allenberg indicator values. So maybe there is a potential that actually some of these values can be really practically used. And we think about the other alternative Allenberg indicator values for temperature, uh, for moisture, for wind effect. And uh, this should be actually the master topic thesis for another my student, uh, Shin Hong Chu. Okay, so uh, one reason why we study cloud forests is because we suppose that in the future they will be affected by the climate change because uh, due to the warming, the cloud layer is uplifting. And this might mean that actually where now we see the cloud forest, uh, in the future the cloud forest will not occur. Uh, there are some studies from Mexico and from Puerto Rico which already actually detect this situation. And we suppose that in Taiwan, this is actually going to happen in the future also. So we try to set up permanent plots, uh, small or large scales to allow in the future monitoring of the vegetation changes due to the climate change. I kind of didn't believe in climate change before, but I kind of start to believe in climate change quite heavily recently when I see, <laughs> when I see the reality. <laughs> and that's all actually, thank you very much. This is, I want to thanks to all my students. Uh, who help with collecting the data, measuring in the lab. I want to thanks to Professor Xie, who allow us the access to the databases, to herbarium databases, to Dr. Huang for, from Soil Laboratory for soil analysis. And yeah, I should also thanks to Ministry of Science and Technology for all the money I got from them. And so thank you very much. And sorry that I'm 10 minutes longer than I should be. And I'm happy to answer the questions if there are any. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. It was excellent presentation. You took us right in the middle of your forest and you did a lot of work with your students. Uh, it's, yeah, it is amazing. Thank I you. think I am sure that there will be a lot of questions that we just have to digest, think about, and then raise the hand. And Petr Schmada is the first. Oh, hello, David. Yo. Thanks for thanks for a nice presentation, and I, I would like to ask if if, if this if these clouds are if there are something positive. What's are positive for plants, and what, what's are negative of these clouds? Because if if I if I think about the physiology, I think this this may be very stressful for plant because if, if there is very high humidity, they okay they they cannot transpire water. And if I imagine that they need to transpire water to, to stack neutral, I think whether this cloudiness can not result in much more increased nutrient limitation. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Theories. Yeah, I think so. So actually you have not too much nutrients in the soil at itself because of the slow decomposition. And then you have actually limitation in nutrient uptake due to the uh, reduce evapotranspiration. So yeah, yeah, that's that's the case. On the other side, you have situation when it's not cloudy, and then the species are trying to catch up with this evapotranspiration business. So you have to think about some of the cloud forests are cloudy, maybe just 30 percent of the time during the year. Some even less. Some have higher cloudiness. Like the most cloudy regions might be like, I don't know the numbers, but maybe 70 percent of the days are heavily cloudy. So that differs in the regions. But yeah, what is positive about cloud for plants, you will not get dry, at least not so easily. So it allows existence of some species which are very drought sensitive. For example, I show those Hymenophilaceae species, they have high diversity actually in the cloud forest, but you won't see them too much outside of the cloud forest. And then the other things are mostly negative, I would say. So it's a stressful environment. Okay, and, and one more about about you. You, you was curious about, about the situation that the soil, that the phosphorus is is much more higher. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's, it's a think? gross celebration. I think. I think it's it's if I learned something about the solar phosphorus, it's it's that it's increased in the areas where is the because it's it it gets into the soil from the minerals. So if there is some erosion, higher erosion, that there is more phosphor there is more phosphorus in the soil. So I think in in the high elevation there is much more crushing of stones and, 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 and so on. So I think could could yeah, could but this, but you know this be the reason because 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 actually our all our sites are on the ridges because we are basically not able to go to those steep these steep plots in Taiwan you are not likely to sample the steep plots if you want to survive so actually most of our sites are on the ridges and that's from lowland to high elevation so I, I know yeah phosphorus originates from the mineral background but I kind of don't understand why actually it increased in concentration in higher elevation especially because I would say the species are actually nutrient limited but maybe they are nitrogen limited. Uh, we try to figure out this by this year we want to do the greenhouse experiment, fertilizing greenhouse experiment to identify whether there is a nitrogen, phosphorus or both limitation. A uh, problem which we face is that we can't find a species, bioindicator species, which can grow on so extremely acid soils. <laughs> pH 3.5. Uh, we did a reddish experiment with Ircha a long time ago in Czech on the oak forest <laughs> soil and it also didn't grow well but the pH was like more than four and all the uh, bioassay species we tried so far always die. <laughs> so it's kind of trouble. Uh, this is the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so Karel, Karel Prach. Caroline. Yes, uh, hello everybody. Um, I think we have in Europe also cloud forest. Uh, I remember a very nice place in Albania at the Logara National Park and there because of a special topography there is no permanent fog and um, I think we can consider it as a cloud forest. Do you agree? Of course a temperate uh, cloud forest. Do you know have it the place? Albania, I don't know, Karola. I don't know Albania. I've seen the cloud forest, something which is called cloud forest in uh, Bavaria in Germany. I've been visiting that region. It's it was in the west of uh, Plzeň. And they also have a region which is actually heavily clouded. It's a beach forest. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can believe, but it's not mountain cloud forest, which actually this mountain cloud forest from these orographic clouds are really in the mountains of subtropical and tropical region. But in Europe, uh, another cloud forest you have on the uh, western coast of United States with those large. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, but or, yeah. or in uh, at Chiloé Island in central Chile, for example, there is uh, there are nice cloud forests. Is there cloud for but a They are close to the coast because of uh, also uh, permanent fog or early permanent fog. But uh, the Logara Mountains in Albania, it's really in the mountains. And uh, because of the topography, which is close to the sea coast, but it's a rather elevated area, and there is a, a bay and special. Uh, wind directions, uh, so it's a very nice place. Uh, fire forests, in fact, with uh, boxes and perverence in understory, and mosses everywhere. Yeah. And where? We should go for nice. excursion. We should go for excursion. We should go for excursion there, Caroline. Take students yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> for, maybe you remember our uh, multi. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, that was my biggest start. travel. Do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but, so thanks. Thank mm. you. Thank, Thank you, you sir, for this comment. Yeah, and Rolda. Microphone. Rolda, my microphone. No. So we have to wait if we will solve this problem or write to the chat. And 
before we will solve some So Milan has a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking the in the meanwhile, waiting for all that. So yes, uh, I, David, I just remember uh, many years ago when uh, we were in the mountains of, of Taiwan together with Woody and you, and we were discussing uh, what are the like ecological determinants of these uh, cloud forests, and uh, I'm really happy that uh, you know probably answers to many of the questions <laughs> that, that we asked that time. Uh, well, it, it was quite interesting to see this water repellency uh, trade yeah. and uh, well uh, water repellency decreased towards uh, higher altitudes uh, within the cloud zone uh, which uh, can mean that uh, probably at lower altitudes there is more rain is it uh, because it's below the cloud zone so so there, there is more rain and uh, at lower elevations water uh, from uh, rain will simply reach soil, while at the cloud zone where there is less rain and water is available in the form of uh, fog uh, to get water uh, into the ecosystem, you need some uh, condensation surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that's why these uh, species, these trees, somehow work as uh, like ecosystem engineers that uh, get uh, water from the atmosphere. So would it be like plausible explanation? Um, could be, could be, yeah. Uh, with the precipitation, precipitation is kind of uh, uh, highest in low middle elevation and then it's decreasing again. So cloud forests actually have quite high precipitation uh, the pattern of precipitation along elevation is not sharply declining, but it's more or less like hump shape in, in Taiwan. So, but uh, for sure cloud forest works by this cloud stripping, by catching condensing water from the cloud and adding the water into the soil. There is also a theory that actually this can bring extra nutrients. There is no real measurement, but uh, if the cloud passes through some polluted area or from some naturally rich area for nutrients, it can actually contain some nutrients and this cloud stripping can enhance nutrient availability in the cloud forest. Might be, might be. Yeah, I, what I read that explanation from Mexico was about that it's adaptation to fight against drought. Uh, but Mexico is different situation because in lower elevation of Mexico is basically semi-desert, but in Taiwan in lower elevation is rainforest. So it's different situation. Yeah, also uh, like a disappointing explanation would be that is just a correlation with some other trait. Uh, yeah. maybe because like when, when we started uh, collecting trait uh, data for the Czech flora, then we realized, well, uh, I was trying uh, at the beginning to interpret uh, like the pattern in each trait ecologically, and then we realized, OK, but but they are all correlated. Uh, so, so they are just a few axes of uh, variation in traits. And uh, now we have many correlations of uh, like uh, vegetation patterns with traits, but uh, <laughs> we really uh, don't know yeah, what is what is the ecologically really significant driver. We, we my, know that there are strong correlations, that's all. My, my observation is actually that in cloud forests, uh, the, the leaves are quite often finely hairy on the below side, on this abaxial side. There is a very, very fine hair. So actually sometimes when you take the leaf and you want to do the droplet on it, you even can't leave it there because it just doesn't want to touch it at all because it's kind of like velvet hairy thing. I, I did almost 2000 droplets. <laughs> So uh, th this is my observation, but what's exactly behind, I really don't know. It's kind of like curious pattern. Maybe what you say might be actually a good explanation. Maybe there is really some correlation with phylogeny. That might be another reason. Yeah. Could, be, could be, maybe, yeah. Hmm? So Rolda, second chance. Rolda. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me now? Yo, yeah. Yo. Mm -hmm. uh, I restarted my computer, so it should work now. 
<clears throat> so thank you, David, uh, for a very nice talk, uh, very nice pictures. And uh, I am really fascinated by the distribution uh, pattern of uh, beach forests uh, in Taiwan. And uh, I wonder whether uh, this uh, pattern could have like historical explanation. Do you know something uh, about the long term history of uh, beach distribution in Taiwan? Could this be like a relic pattern? Yeah, yeah, it's a relic pattern. Yeah, the beach have been distributed in lower elevation during the uh, during the ice age. Uh, it has been distributed as low as I think 900 meters elevation. There are some, there are not too many palynological records in Taiwan actually, but I, I remember there is one lake which has the pollen of the beach and mm -hmm. the time they argue that actually the beach during the colder periods have been widely distributed and basically now it's uplifted to higher elevation because I get because of the warming of the climate after the, after the glacier end glacier era ends and uh, it's kind of like in the combination of several things because it really has to be on the it's always on the ridge of the mountain it does not go too high elevation I would say the highest peak is really around 2000 meters it doesn't go higher elevation and it's always influenced by northeastern monsoon there is no location which wouldn't be influenced by northeastern monsoon I would say Analogical stands would be Kamaitsi Paris dominated forest. And Tamanshan and Lalashan, those two hills are actually good comparison. Tamanshan is white, like it's a very wide ridge. And Kamaitsi Paris can regenerate on the fallen logs of Kamaitsi Paris. And on these narrow ridges, Kamaitsi Paris doesn't really, if it, if it grows, then it will fall down because it's so narrow that actually it can't really regenerate there. I guess that's what I can think about difference maybe the topography, but um, yeah, but it's a relic species. Yeah, it's a, it's a relic species and it's kind of declining. It's heavily protected in Taiwan. We don't have permission to collect it actually. And uh, it's declining in the population because the trees are not regenerating. There is clear regeneration failure, at least from the observation. Yeah, but it's quite interesting. I, I agree. Yeah, actually, I quite like it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank Might you. Be interesting to look uh, on like soil charcoal uh, about the history of distribution of. Yeah. Species. You mean because of fire or because of the? Uh, simply like uh, a proxy of past distribution, so it, it it would be possible to trace its distribution yeah. on uh, a, like average average sites where you usually don't have information on, on yeah. the history. Uh, so it, it, it might be Ta worth Taiwan, ta Taiwan has a little bit troubles with this kind of evidence because Taiwan has very high erosion rate. So uh -huh. you have, yeah, it's kind of, you have really very few places where you can take sample, which would have been staying there for a long time. So I think that's a little bit trouble. That's also why actually palynological studies from Taiwan are quite sparse. Uh, not only because there are not too many palynologists, but also because actually uh, there are not too many places to do this study. Few lakes where you can core the sediment. And uh, 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 here you might use just local local uh, sites, uh, some depressions where the sediment accumulates. Accumulates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Monica. Ahoj, David. Ciao, uh, ciao. Thank you. It was a very nice uh, presentation. I only have two very short questions. I would like to know how many species there are in Taiwan. And also, because I don't, I cannot build the picture in my head. Uh, how do you work? All, with to, all together, species? all together. Uh, it's like 4,000, 4,500 species 4, in Taiwanese flora. Yeah. How many of them are wood species and how many of them are ferns? Uh, ferns are quite diverse. Ferns, I would say, are around 900 species. And I'm, I'm not good in numbers, actually. I would say woody species might be 1,200. Uh, quite a lot of them are woody species. But total number, I I would say woody species around 1,000 and ferns might be also around 1,900, 900 to 1,000 species. Uh, 
when you think you are in the forest and you are doing vegetation plot 20 by 20 meters in some like lower cloud forest, upper cloud forest is not too diverse, but lower cloud forest is quite diverse. You get in this 400 square meters, you get something between 30 to 50 woody species and comparable number of ferns. So it's quite nice. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. how many they are endemics? I mean, uh, which are bound to this cloud forest? You mean how many species are in the cloud forest? Uh, endemic, endemic species. Yeah, there is a saying that actually cloud forest supports endemicity, but I didn't see any numbers for that. Uh, there is some brief overview in Flora of Taiwan about endemicity of species, but I, I wanted to show it because I know that there is a saying cloud forest is usually typical by endemic species, but in Taiwan endemic species are mostly in higher elevation. In cloud forest there are some endemic species, but it's not really like super many. So mm. I think this in Taiwan this doesn't work actually for endemic species, but in the, the other regions it sounds like. I don't know too much how old is cloud forest biome or this habitat in Taiwan because maybe during the ice age actually it just didn't occur. Cloud has been sparser and maybe the cloud forest as we know it now actually didn't exist. Uh, also when you see the combination of species now there are some sclerophyll species, some conifer species, there are some deciduous species. It's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting mixture. But actually cloud forest in Taiwan might be quite young, even though it looks quite ancient. But as a vegetation type, it might be actually quite a young type, but hard to say. Monica, and what was the second question? Uh, I wanted to ask about these uh, hectare plots, you know, 100 by 100 meters, whether you really study all plants, uh, also the undergrowth plants, these grasses, <laughs> everything. Yeah, so so you know, but because you, you do quite a lot of damage in the underground when you do the survey of woody species. So for woody species, you survey each individual, which has at least one centimeter dBH and is at least two meters tall. So you need to uh, tag it, mark it, measure precisely dBH, and draw the map of these individuals. So actually, it takes really time. <laughs> and for herb understory, what we did, because we should not trample it, because if we trample it during measuring of the woody species, then the herbs are gone. So what we did when we delineate the plots, that we make a fixed plot in the middle of each 10 by 10 meters for herb layer, 2 by 2 meters only. And that one we delineate it, we make a boundary very obvious so as people doesn't trample it. And then we survey the herbs layer there. But uh, the herb layer, it's, it's kind of, in that forest, it's quite sparse, actually. It doesn't have too many species in our permanent plot. Some other places are more diverse, but in our plot, it's not actually so diverse. So the pattern in species composition and the relationship to environment is quite weak. Uh, woody species is quite strong. What is interesting, woody species is strongly influenced by windwardness, by the effect of wind. Herbs, not at all. They don't mm -hmm. care because they are sheltered by the by the woody species, which is kind of trivial, but it's kind of interesting to see that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Thanks. So for those who are interested in the numbers, so the numbers are in chat. Thanks, Milan. And uh, yeah, Carol, you have well, still the hand is raised. So no, maybe... no, it was my mistake. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, uh, I'm... Okay, looks like we are we are satisfied. I see. Yeah, I, I see in the chat. I see some uh, some comments. Yeah, no, so so. Better <laughs> uh, and then. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Can I have one more question? One more question. Thank you. Uh, okay. What is your experience, David, with invasive species in this kind of uh, forest? Are there any at all? No, cloud forest doesn't get invaded, actually. I think cloud forest doesn't have anything to offer. Uh, because, uh, because yeah, if you want to invade, then you need actually available nutrients, and cloud forest is really short in nutrients. But yeah, we we, we actually are interested in inf uh, invasive species. We have a database which has been done during the invasive project from Professor Shea, 
uh, one of my students is actually working on those data to see actually the pattern of invasive invisibility along elevation gradient and also in the relationship to landscape uh, configuration and land use pattern. But in the nature forest, you get very few invasive species. Just along the trails, when you hike to the mountains, the disturbance, there is like, uh, there are some spreading, some non-native species, but really very few, which is perhaps good news. Taiwan actually has quite low proportion of invasive species, considering that it's island. I think currently the count is around 11%. I think 11% of Taiwanese flora are not native introduced species, which is not so bad, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Petra. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no more question. Uh, what, will, what, what, what factors affect or what will kill the species or kill, kill, kill the trees? Are, are, are there some fungi? In, it is fungi infection or is something something more? I, I would expect that the, that the pressure for, from fungi will be much more higher in humid because until now you have concentrated on how, how they are established, how, how new, new are established. But but my question is what, what, what will kill them? And you if know, there is something in, in common for yeah, you know, you know what, what, what is, what is kind of strange. What I'm recently observing more and more, especially in that region we study, because we go there very frequently, are obviously a lot of dead Kamaitsiparis trees. So when you go to the mountains and you see those slopes with the cloud forest, you see many of these white trunks of the Kamaitsiparis trees. And I, I just don't know whether I did not pay attention before when we hiked to the cloud forest, or whether it's really getting drier and this drought will, because Kamaitsiparis needs to be in the cloudy conditions. It's kind of not really competitively strong outside of the cloud. And uh, maybe when it's getting drier, the dry events are more frequent. Maybe this might actually result eventually in decreased uh, ability of the trees to survive. Kamaitsiparis oot is very hard. Uh, it's uh, it has these allelopathic compounds. It's actually decaying very slowly. Almost nothing can grow on Kamaitsiparis wood. The other trunks of broadleaf species are covered by seedlings of the other species, but Kamaitsiparis doesn't because it has some allelopathy in the wood. Uh, but uh, I guess it's also like adapted against fungi infection due to this allelopathy, but I, this part I don't know actually. Woody used to have a student who study fungi Horoshe, I don't know how to say it in English. This kind of, you know, this monkey can step on it to climb up to the tree. <laughs> and she was actually usually finding this this uh, fungi not on the conifers, but on the evergreen broadleaf, on oaks, Castanopsis, Cyclobalanopsis, uh, which actually are dying. Uh, the large trees in Taiwan, lowland doesn't have large trees because they are very quickly rotten. In higher elevation, you got large trees because they grow slower, they have harder wood and they doesn't get rotten so quickly. But uh, yeah, answer, I don't know actually, Petra, what kills the tree. Uh, drought in the cloud forest might be the problem. Surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, the cloud is lifting. Yeah, so actually in the lower, low, there, where is cloud forest now? In some places actually you got already so much dry events, then maybe those cloud adapted species, they simply can't survive there. But uh, I don't I don't know, that's just my feeling. Okay, thanks. Mm. Thank you. And Eva? Eva. Mm -hmm. I have some funny questions. Uh, do you can recognize funny. all the species? <laughs> No. No. How do you do that? How do I do? Uh, well, it's it's kind of tricky. Like this year, uh, I opened the vegetation survey class again. We before teach it always with Woody, and this year I teach it by myself, and I feel quite frustrated because I feel quite silly in front of students because I don't know the species. I I try, but for all those evergreen broadleaf species, I have good ability to determine ferns. That's kind of like my thing. I like it. But woody species, especially those laureates, they look all the same. 
No, no, not really. Yeah, I try, I try. Here there is another trouble a little bit is with uh, the names because Taiwanese are quite good in taxonomy. They know the names of the species, but they know it in Chinese. You can see on my slides, I actually include always Chinese name of the species because if I have this presentation in Taiwan, if I say Latin name, the people will not know actually. But if I say Chinese name, even my pronunciation is quite silly, but uh, they will know what's going on. So in the field, I have a uh, I have a checklist which have the pinyin, which have the pinyin pronunciation. So actually, I'm able to say the species also in Chinese without really reading Chinese, but pronouncing it in Chinese, and that kind of works. So there is, it's kind of getting better, but it takes time. You know, so many species. It must be very difficult for you. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> it's a challenge, but. It's a uh, yeah, <laughs> open challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I think this is just the first step, but if you have to measure the leaf traits of such a species in the field, as I saw the, the photos of the interior, I can't imagine how you collect. The <laughs> yeah, but you know what? We have the cutting because you need to collect the leaves which are sun exposed. So actually yeah, you have yeah, to really so. cut it from the top. So uh, Taiwanese are quite good in this because uh, okay. Taiwanese, yeah. they like the betel nuts, you know, betel of our palma, these betel mm -hmm. nuts to chew it with, uh, mm -hmm. and it makes the teeth completely red. And uh, mm -hmm. they are usually around 14, 15 meters tall and they farmers, they need to cut those nuts. So there is a knife which is like two meters tall, but it can be like telescopically fold, unfolded into like 14 meters. So this is what we carry to the forest and then we are like collecting it. It take, takes quite mm -hmm. a lot of time, but it's kind of, yeah, it's kind mm -hmm. of fun. And yeah. you, you need to collect the leaves, you need to collect the branches, you have to take the busher back to the lab. You don't really rely yeah, on a uh, mm -hmm. field. And then you need to really make sure there's quite few misdetermination actually, eventually, which mm -hmm. will be uncovered when we see that the trait is completely different than the other individuals of the same species, we go back to the bushers and see, okay, that was misdetermination. Mm. Yeah. But ferns are more difficult to measure. Ferns are easy to collect, but very difficult to measure because they are so fine, you know. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I really wonder how you did so many measurements and collect so many data. Okay. Now, I wanted to publish it, actually. That's the weak part. <laughs> Yeah. So the very last chance for your question, comment. If not, David, thank you very much for your presentation. We thank enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you very Good much for the invitation. With all your dreams and <laughs> next work. And see you and in summer. Soon. See you in summer. Yeah. Hope so. <laughs> I'm happy to see you. Yeah. No, that's my city. <laughs> okay. So have a nice day. And yeah. greetings to Bruno and greetings to everywhere. See you, see you later. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Ciao. Ciao.